Good evening and welcome to A1 TV, The Mark Show. Today, I'm going to go down a different tack. I'm going to bring you a new guest, a guest of different. I'm going to go to a guy they call John X. Now, you people say, who is John X? What is John X? Well, I'll let John X explain why his name is X and where X lives and what X does. But John, welcome to the show. Mark, thanks so much uh, for having me. It's an absolute honour and a pleasure. I must admit, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to be a part of your program and I've, I've been a, an avid watcher of the episodes and um, all these sort of amazing sporting heroes and, and legends and storytellers that you've had on. It's been fantastic. So I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled that, um, that I get to be a part of that. So thank you very much. That's right. Now, John X, now tell the viewers, the X, what does it stand for, please, John? Oh, the X is the first letter of my surname, which is uh, Xinda Bolonis, which is Greek. Uh, a Greek for Smith. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> did you did you name yourself X? Yeah, oh, no, it sort of happened uh, when I started uh, my, uh, early on uh, as an actor. Um, the reviewers in the newspaper started calling me John X because they worked out, because they're all on a word count. They worked out they could fit three or four extra words in the review if they didn't print my whole sort of surname. So and that's how it happened. Because my friends at the Think High School used to call me Zinta, which is the first four letters of my name. So um, it just sort of stuck from there. And we liked it. And my dad, actually, he owned a, a corner store called the Bayview Store. And underneath it had proprietor Mr. X. And that's what I must, I guess the sign writer would have done that. So yeah, we've had X in the family for a while. And we like it. It's a, it's a point of difference that always stands out. And then if you hear the name once, you tend to sort of remember it. So Now X, who is actually in Hobart, is a, is a resident of Hobart. And Tasmania, one of the greatest places you'll ever find on the planet, let me tell you. I endorse oh, yeah. it highly. But uh, I'm a public schoolboy ex myself, and I was looking at doing a bit of research for the interview. Gilson Bay High School, Linda's Farm, Eastern Shore, yeah, and Rosney College. Linda's primary, uh, yeah, Gilson Bay High School and Rosney College. Yeah, public school boy. In fact, I had the honour of being, it was the 150th anniversary of Tasmanian public schooling a couple of years back, and uh, I had the honour of being one of the... Um, public school ambassadors for a whole year. It was great. Good got to go around and talk to schools and, you know, just talk up how um how great public education is, you know, where there's so much focus on, you know, oh, you're gonna do really well if you're in a, in a private school. In fact, I don't know if you saw recently there was a there was a, a story in one of the papers about how many of the high flying sort of AFL players all sort of come from private schools. Like there's a massive I think only 36% of the AFL players come from public schools in the AFL. The rest all come from private schools, which I thought, wow, that's interesting. But, you know, yeah, there's been a lot of focus on private schooling. And, you know, it all boils down to who you are and the kid and what you want to achieve. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's certain things that private schools allow you to do or open the door easier for you. But one of them is rowing. But other than that, you know, I think it doesn't matter where you go to. And I'm very proud to, to be a public school kid. And I, you know, I think myself and my mates and that have, have done all right. Now, X, uh, you actually did play sport as a kid. Now, uh, a Greek boy, young Greek boy, soccer, they would think would be a bit of a game for you. But you actually played many sports in your junior days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, and I'm a massive sporting fan. There pretty, isn't, I mean, pretty much isn't any sort of sporting code that I don't have a team that I support. But I started soccer because I was Greek and, and dad and made sure that that happened. I just played for Lindisfarne for a very long time and they became Lindisfarne repeat. And then I went to, I think, Olympia for a while. And then I went and played with a team called Metro. Um, in the Metro Soccer Club down here. So, and I, and I played for most of my life up until my early to mid 20s, I think I was playing. And then my sort of acting career took over. I realized very early that I would, uh, wouldn't, wasn't going to make much money playing sport, but I maybe had a shot at a career in, in theatre. Most of my parents' are disappointment. But yeah, I did soccer as, as sort of all through primary and then got into high school and got into, um, played some, uh, some AFL and some cricket there because we love playing cricket especially here in the summer. We used to go out and play, you know, till about 9.30 at night during daylight savings. So we'd literally play till someone got hit in the head with the ball and then we'd realise, okay, we obviously can't see anymore. So we'd go home. So we used to love that. So AFL and cricket in high school and then got to college. That's where I started doing drama. When I say college, college here in Tasmania is years 11 and 12. So it's like the upper high school of the mainland states. Yeah, I played basketball. They used to call me Rene because I was like shorter than most of them and big tubby. So after Rene Kink, <laughs> Paul basketballers nicknamed me Rene. So I was this little sort of short, fat bloke running around the basketball court. And then I played some badminton, which was great. That was probably the highlight of my sporting career in that we played the entire year unbeaten and then got in the grand final and lost. What was it about? Because no. bad, badminton's a bit of a... I know we'll talk about your footy tragic because you're a footy tragic. We'll talk about that a bit later, which I'll have to have a yeah. discussion with you. But the badminton side of it, where did that come into play? Just something you picked up a rack and thought, this is good? 
Yeah, yeah, I just saw them doing it one day um, at college during lunchtime. And yeah, and I met a couple other guys, you know, who weren't necessarily in my friends sort of circle. Like I think I, I made Dave Sham, I think, was playing with me. At the, there was oh, two okay. of us and two other guys. And um, yeah, we, we we just did it. It was good and we seemed to do quite well together. You sort of played singles and you played doubles. When you played other kids, you played like four or five different games each, but you'd double up and, and we did all right. Yeah, but I don't know, we just... Just came in. Again, it was another sport. It had something you hit with something else. I was keen to do it. I love my sport. Much of the dead family and my friends and stuff. Like, you know, I'll watch all the grand finals of everything, sometimes by myself. <laughs> when you had the Rosny and you got into drama and theatre sports, because I'm, I've, when I when I, and I went to Hobart in 98, or 99, I think it was, and I met you. But the thing is that um, theatre sports was something I'd never heard about until I went to Hobart. So it was theatre sports where your love of drama and acting come up. Was that, did it happen before that, or was that was that the place? Oh, it sort of happens just before that. In year ten, we got to go to Rosny College, which is our the college we went to, or the year eleven and twelve school that we had to go to, to have a look at the subjects. And I remember having watching, you know, being in on a drama class and watching, and they seem to just be having fun, dicking around, and not doing much. And I thought, gee, this is for me. I want to, I want to have some fun. So um, that's why I did it. It just looked like an easy subject to do. And pass, and then I naturally found out just that I was naturally good at it when I was doing it. I, I could speak quite well and quite loudly, and I knew if I slowed down and articulated everything I said, I'd get a pass. You know, in my poetry and prose examination, at, you know, mid-year sort of thing. So it, it was just came naturally. And out of that, that was the height of, of theatre sports. And again, here's a, an institution or an initiative that combines my love of sport and my love of theatre. You know, competitive theatre is basically what it is. And you just basically improvise, make stuff up on the spot, which was gold. And, you know, and that's where, um, that's the other sort of height of my sporting career, if you want to call it that, is mid-80s. Of course, you get away with a lot more than the stuff we got away with at school. And you got to remember, it was so popular. Entire college, like about 1,200 students, whatever, would give up their whole lunch hour to come and watch theatre sports in the main auditorium. It was extraordinary. Don't know why you wouldn't get kids doing that nowadays. They wouldn't give a rat's butt about it, but they all flocked to see us. And we were in a team called, pardon my French, the Kitty Porn Merchants is what we used to call ourselves, which was just appalling. You know, you'd get you'd get shut down. You'd get you'd get extradited to, to Russia if you'd said that now. Then we had to change our name to PAWN, like a pawn shop, like a second hand sort of shop. When you think back at it, you think, oh my God, what were we thinking? But we were huge. We were like, you know, the NFL sort of college quarterbacks, basically, in that school. Everyone knew who we were. They all came and watched us every Friday. And we were lucky to be in a team with Jason and Bernard and Again, Dave Sheehan, there's that name pops up again. And me in a team that just that won and won the grand final. And it was involved with a whole bunch of parade and music. And we had these flashy gold jackets with stars on them and stuff. It was it was a bit wanky. But uh, when you're a 16, 17-year-old, it was a great way to meet chicks. <laughs> hey, X, we'll talk about that later. You're a married man now. The thing that that made you or does you decided that I can make a career. You've been in theatre sports. You've come out of Rosny College. And then you say, okay, what am I going to do for life? So how did that transition from being a 16, 17 year old at Rosny College into a career? Good question. Because in Tasmania, even still now, um, we don't really have a, a, a massive professional industry. So it was really hard back when I was young. And I, thought I, did, I sort of did two things. I decided I was going to, my parents wouldn't let me go away and train. I was encouraged to audition for NIDA around about the same time that Tasmanian actress Essie Davis, who was in the same college, the same drama club we were, she went off and she, because she's a massive star now. Uh, my parents wouldn't let me do that. One is their 17-year-old Greek boy running around King's Cross in Sydney on his weekends, I guess. So um, I decided I was going to get training by just doing lots of shows here. And at the same time, I loaned some money. I want my parents to, to open up a little video shop. So I used to run a video shop for about 20 years or so that um, allowed me to have a cash flow. Well, I basically did a whole lot of amateur shows in Hobart, trained up. And then all of a sudden, someone saw me in a show once in the late 80s, 88, 89, and signed me up to the, on the only casting agency we had here at the time. And then someone else saw me and uh, paid me to be in a play called, um, what was it called? Norman Armit. And it was a play. We did it in the pub. That's like theatre in the pub was a popular thing as well. An old Australian bloke. I was, you know, I was a 19-year-old playing a middle-aged Australian bloke. Me it's a Pakistani student at a bus stop at midnight and it's all quite sort of threatening and then throughout the sort of course of the play you realise oh you know they're really lovely this man's not threatening at all you know so it's okay uh, and then right at the end when they go to shake hands um, the middle aged guy yanks the Pakistani kid in and swears at him and beats the living hell out of him and kicks him and causing him an effing boom and walks off the stage. This is a play in the 60s that caused a lot of controversy. That play was very popular, so my exposure grew and then I got a call up after winning an amateur award with the Variety Club 
awards. I got a call up from a state theatre company to play the butterfly and the caterpillar in their outdoor professional production of Alice in Wonderland. That was 92, 93, I think. And then uh, I got into their Shakespeare for that year, Comedy of Errors. And then I went straight into Louis Nara's Cosy, which is another place. I did like three professional shows in a row. At one point I was on two salaries because I was rehearsing one during the day and performing another at night. Was that in Hobart X? That was in, in Hobart. Hobart. And I did a lot of that. And then my career sort of took off. I did a lot of commercials on telly to the point where I nearly became, I guess, overexposed in a way. I um, mean, in the late 90s, I decided to try and make it for the mainland. So I'm kidding into my late twenties, around about when we were doing football life. So I applied to all these agents. I did got my C V together and got a lovely cardboard headshot of my head. I used to have hair. And then sent that off with um a videotape. Like I think I sent thirty Video tapes in yellow bags, like uh, it cost me 430 bucks to take a. Nowadays, you do all this online, it costs yeah. you nothing. And uh, I got eight agents who wrote back to me. I think I went and saw three of them and I chose one. Then I started auditioning for stuff and it was a bit hit and miss to begin with. And it was expensive back then, 25 years ago, to fly to Melbourne for an audition. It's costing you like 530 bucks return. So uh, you had to pick and choose what you were doing. And then just one day they rang and said, Oh, you want to come and audition for Pumba and the Lion King? And I went, Oh, yeah, okay. And basically, cut a long story short, got the role and spent two years doing that in Sydney, Melbourne and, and Shanghai. And then I got into Billy Elliot and then I got into Jekyll and Hyde and that toured South Korea. And then I came back and did um, the Thripney Opera for Malthouse and Sydney Theatre Company and did Boy From Oz with Todd McKinney in between that. Then I went to the Opera Australia South Pacific production. And then most recently, I've just done The Wizard of Oz playing The Lion in 2017, 18 and went back to do Lion King in 2015, 16. So the work's been really good, but it's all been out of here. And I've been very lucky in that my agent's allowing me to, well, be represented by her, I guess, and commute because a lot of people don't get to, to do that. So I've been very lucky, but because I had established a life here first, that was what had to happen. So, and it's quite frustrating because I'm a massive, massive, as you know, Bombers fan and doing a contract, with Billy Elliot, for a year in, in Melbourne. But the problem is when you do work in professional musical theatre, you have shows on every time there's a game. You do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday <laughs> afternoon, yeah. sa- Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, or in Lion King's case, Sunday afternoon afternoon sunday night so you're walking this way to the theater while thousands of people are walking past you in the opposite direction with their football scarves going to the football and you've got to go to as what is essentially work but you know two thousand people clap and cheer at the end of your day so it's not it's not a bad job to have but yeah frustrating that i hardly saw any football that time live being in the you know the land of football in, in melbourne it was very frustrating i think i remember once paying a ridiculous price at what is now Marvel Stadium, to sit in the second level place seats. But by myself, I think I saw a, a Tigers Bulldogs game uh, by myself just to get some AF, live AFL. I love the game, no stress because my team wasn't playing. But I think it cost me like 90 bucks or something for the ticket. I paid something ridiculous, but I didn't care because I wanted to see some football. But that's basically how my career took off. And that's to the point now where I got married and have kids. So that slows you down a bit. And I mean, just producing Tasmania's first ever fully commercial professional musical as we speak. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a big risk, especially in this COVID sort of period. But we've been very lucky. There's a bit of survivor guilt for me as I talk to you. And we're, you know, nudging on 18 months or something with no COVID sort of here, no community transmission COVID yet at all. So we're really lucky. We haven't been locked down since March last year. <laughs> I hate to use the L word in your presence because I know you guys have been doing it really, really tough and, and I feel for you. But yeah. no, none of my colleagues are performing in theatre at the moment. It's all us down here in Tasmania. So we're being very, very, we're very, very lucky. We thank our lucky stars and we're careful not to gloat too much about it. So you just got to live your life day by day at the moment and live it to the full because anything could happen as COVID has shown us overnight. One thing, one second you find, next second you're locked down and you guys know that more than. Yeah, exactly right. Now, I met you in, I was just working out, I met you in 1999, actually, when we did a pilot for that jacket you have on called Football Life. And that was a, a program which uh, was an idea from Dave Sheen, Martin Duffy. And you were actually part of the pilot program that actually got us to gig to do 26 shows on Win TV every Saturday at lunchtime. It was a magnificent time. And I met you. And you were actually involved back then in a thing called the Merc Kick, right? Now, you've done a lot of TV, radio, theatre, and now I hear you on ABC radio so you're a multifunctional <laughs> actor with a whole of the strings to your bow X because you do radio you've done some tv commercials you do theater that, that's an amazing effort to have that that sort of like criteria in your box that you do you go across different platforms we get forced to do that in, in tasmania because we don't have a professional sort of theater industry as such and there's we don't produce a lot of tv a bit more gets produced here now things like the kettering incident and the gloaming a lot of film crews come down here and film in the state recently so we've had some big shows that we've all had sort of 
guest roles on. And Rosehaven, for example, I've had a guest role on, on that as well. So a lot of stuff gets made now. But back then it doesn't. So you've got to be – I realised very early on that I, I had to be quite versatile. So I, I had to learn to, you know, public speak and stuff. So I do a lot of corporate – so you, you host events and you sing at concerts and you – now, in my case, you know, fill in broadcaster for ABC Radio. Uh, mainly breakfast, but I can do afternoons and evenings and what have you. Yeah, you got to really sort of prostitute yourself around a bit and have, and be and be versatile. And a lot of it just boils down to doing what we're doing now, and that is just talking. Um, and I've always been a good talker. I was one of those kids that always got into trouble at school for talking too much. So um, that's what happened. You got to you got to spread yourself quite thinly to make a career out of you know any kind of live performance or performing art here in Tasmania. So that's what I've done. I'm one of the very few who has never had a, a day job. You know, the closest I've had a day job is working for the ABC, and that's not really. I don't look at that as a job. And it's because I'm not permanent there. I can hand it back too. It's like babysitting. Do you pick the musical criteria? Because I've listened to your breakfast show and I like the and I. And if anybody listed, I want if you can follow John X on Facebook or social media, he actually films some of the time when he's on ABC Radio. When he your music beds, do you create your music beds, or is it you just bring oh, your no, own music? I'll be honest. What happens is ABC have a, a playlist that every program gets because they all have a breakfast program and a mornings program and an afternoon program and a drive program, and they all there's someone at the ABC head office who does the playlist of the songs the same. Everywhere around the country. So if you're listening to the Drive program in Hobart, uh, if you hear a couple of songs, they should be similar to the couple of songs you're hearing everywhere else around the country. That's how it's supposed to work. But because I come in as a fill-in, I literally look at that scene. There's nothing I like on that sheet. I will choose my own music. Yes, yeah, so I'm a bit naughty. But because I'm a babysitter, you now when you have the baby, when people babysit your kids, like your grandparents, the grandparents, they might, you know, give them chocolate when you never give them chocolate or they let them on the iPads when you don't give it. But you don't yell at them because you need them. You know, sometimes they ring me at 10 o'clock at night and say, can you please do breakfast? And it's literally six hours later. I've got to, at four in the morning, I've got to be at ABC Radio across the bridge to do a program. Unprepared, I just look at it and go, who am I talking to? Oh, yeah, Mark Stone about football. Okay, sure. You know, no background. You just sort of, you got to hope the person you're talking to is going to be a good talker and, and talk a lot about, about what they're doing. So, yeah, no, I make, I, I choose a lot of songs myself because I know people like it. Man, I get these messages. We give a live text thing at the ABC and we go, oh, I love the music when you're on Johnny. It's like, no, but I'm not supposed to choose it, but I do choose it because I'm, I'm there for a good time and not a long time. And people, when you're on as a, as a guest presenter or as a filling presenter, people, it's like they want to have a holiday, a bit of a break for a holiday. So I don't, I tend not to do a lot of the serious stuff either. I like to leave that for the mornings program. So I'll try not, unless something breaks, we had a fire in a pub that broke a couple of months back here, you know, happened at sort of two in the morning. We're the first program back. So we had to, and again, being the beautiful thing about being Tasmanian at that point was I knew the pub because my daughter danced right next door to the pub. I knew the pub owners because they used to run another pub over here in the Eastern Shore. So I rang them. We got their number on the sly and uh, were able to ring them and, and break the story and news were taking grabs. And, you know, that's a beautiful thing about living in Tasmania. We're all like half a degree of separation. But yeah, to answer you, a long way of answering your question, no, I, yeah, I choose a lot of the songs I do. And I just, I, I post stuff of me, you know, singing along with them and stuff because some people tell me, can you let us know when you're on because we love to listen. So I do that on social media and they wake up and they'll, they'll, they'll switch on. But, you know, it's a good look. It's a good gig to have, but I couldn't do it permanently. I still think I'm far too cool and far too young at 51 to be working permanently at the ABC. Now, what about the music voice? Because I've actually heard you sing. And you actually actually got a pretty good voice. Was singing always no, something in your repertoire? Never had lessons. Just learned on the job. No, at 24, I agreed. I was doing this that play I mentioned, Cosy. I agreed to to uh, to do this musical, uh, for the Gilbert and Sullivan musical at the Theatre Hall here. And I filled in three weeks to go because someone pulled out. Some guy in it was arguing a workers' compensation claim with his employer in court and realised that he probably shouldn't be skipping around the stage while trying to claim injury at <laughs> work. So he pulled out. I was working at this with this director on it. She was production manager on the professional show I was doing. He said, do you mind coming and filling in? I went, yeah, sure. Realising that I'd never sort of sung before. So that was a bit of a initiation by fire into singing. But realised I had a, a decent ear. I could hear something and, and mimic it. And so I could just copy the tune and just started singing. The more I sang, the more confident I got. It just took off from there. And now I do big band shows with my two mates in a thing called Croon with an 18-piece big band and dancers and stuff. And that's just another sideline, another way we've had to branch out to sort of create more income for ourselves. And it's a great way of doing it because it's a whole, there's a whole sort of older demographic that love all that Dean Martin, Sinatra sort of stuff we do. So we, we do that. That's another sort of angle. But again, it's like you've got to have all these pots in the fire to pull all the income together to try and make some kind of annual salary out of, you know. And then of course, 
But if you're really smart, you marry a clinical psychologist who is an essential worker and works with kids with autism and Asperger's. It is very smart, works all through the pandemic, sometimes at home on Zoom like this. I mean, look at us doing this now. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't pandemic. Show the the viewers that uh, shirt you've got on, the Rocky Horror one. Now, X is about to embark on a five-week program of the Rocky Horror Show, which for which you're the narrator, and I believe you're playing Riff Raff in that uh, that piece of... (laughs) And your wife, is your wife an actress or you met her, your wife? Through. She's a dancer. Yeah. She's an actress and a spirit singer, and but mainly a dancer. She was a dancer when I met her. She's a very good tap dancer and a very good jazz dancer. Yes, yeah, so she's an ex dancer. So we produce her and I and a friend of ours called Ben Armitage, who's an optometrist for Specsavers. We're producing this show because I've been working in the industry on the mainland for so many years and, and sort of watching what happens and how they put these shows together. We sort of thought, you know, it's time we up the ante here in Hobart. They only ever do sort of amateur shows. No one's done a fully professional commercial musical before. So we took the plunge. It's got a one point four million dollars dollar budget so you know every day when the premier does his COVID update here on facebook we all hold our collective breaths because the second we get a case they'll shut it down and then i'll i'll be coming and sleeping on your couch mark over in melbourne if that happens um so yeah we wanted to raise the bar a bit and we've got some really good talented tasmanians who ha- didn't do what i did and didn't sort of take the plunge to go to the mainland we wanted to give them an avenue and it's a big wake-up call for the tasmanian cast here because they all realized they've got, had to work for four weeks 10 to 6 full time and the rest we have we auditioned around the country and people put in and auditioned and we cast the show and then we got put off because of COVID the theatre said to us we can't let you in this is in October last year when we'd nearly gone 5 months with no cases but we weren't opening we've been very anal about opening down here and it's been good for us because we've been safe but you know it's been tough and I feel for the tourism even though the theatres are back at 100% tourism still suffering because no one can, can come in here so all the tourist places are suffering so we postponed the show to this year and 98% of the people who'd already booked transferred their tickets over which is great and our cast who came from the mainland some of whom are ex-Tasmanians coming back they're really excited to to work back home but they they all had to come back and quarantine so we had to blew the budget out by about 30 grand sticking 90 percent of them in airbnbs around the city for two weeks so they were literally they've gone from lockdown to quarantine to coming out and rehearsing and they sort of they staggered some of them couldn't get in one of them from new south wales had to go into government quarantine here that was the rule government ran out of hotel room so he didn't get into about the third time so he didn't get out of he zoomed into rehearsal from his hotel room near the airport for the first week and a half I think and got into the end end of the second week or something or end of the first week someone else got in the end of the second week out of quarantine but there they all out and the show is ready to go and everyone's very excited it's the biggest thing Hobart's uh, Tasmania's ever had as far as musical theatre is concerned it's nothing's ever run for five weeks here before but it's selling really well we've just extended for another week and people are really pumped and I think it's people need it and a show like Rocky Horror which is just off the dial I mean you wouldn't want to bring anyone under sort of 13 or 14 to it because the the bedroom scene in the start of the second act a bit of an eye opener for your kids. They'll have a lot for show and tell on Monday if they come and see that. But it's very, I think the audiences really need that. People are really, really excited. And people stop me in the street and thank me for, for doing this. And I'm like, well, you know, I've got to do it. It's all I have. You know, it's, it's what I do. My, our industry is completely decimated. And I was very good. Very, I was very good. I was very clever back in April this year. Was, we were verging on a year with no COVID. So we started kicking the government a little bit in the media. And the media, of course, are always good for a stash. So basically, the Premier eventually rang and said, you can come and see. So I had a meeting with Premier Gutman and he said, look, I'll fix this for you. I'll get them open. Can you give me till after National Cabinet on April 9th? Of course, at that point, he knew he was calling election in the first week of May. I didn't know that. So he rang me after National Cabinet on April 9th and said, can we do a photo at the Theatre Royal? And I said, why? And he said, well, we're about to go one hundred percent no masks in the theatres. And that gave us the confidence to promote the show because we were about to pull it again, like completely. We couldn't just keep going on like this. It was too risky. But thanks to him for doing that whether he did it because you had an election coming up and didn't want me um, mouthing off in the media about our show having to be cancelled. I don't know. I don't care. We got it open and uh, and, and the show's going ahead and um, we're very excited about it. And it's a game changer. It's, it's history making for Tassie. And if it works, it means we'll do other shows and mainland producers who do all these fantastic shows. And I urge everyone to get out there and support them as soon as they come back. They'll think twice about not bringing something to, to Tassie because there is a market for it down here. I mean, that, that stretch of water has always posed a problem for us. And I, I still think it's a problem you know for the afl as well and giving us a, a football team you know that's what you want annoys that, people that'll happen x you'll get an you'll get an afl team have no doubt about that the one thing about that i really love about tasmania and hobart especially is the uniqueness you can you can have a meeting with the premier of the state by mate yeah. just picking up the phone right and i've always loved that about tasmania is because you can just go you want to talk to someone just talk to them it's an amazing if thing. you didn't someone chances are your neighbor did or your friend did or you know you gotta remember this is why we're so safe here as well there's only 500 odd thousand people in the state 
we're social distancing without even trying down here, gentlemen. We can't fill the landmass that we have. So that, that helps us a lot. So there's not that many of us here, so it's quite easy. You pretty much know everyone. I'll tell you what, you'd be hard pushed to get in the tree. You wouldn't want to have an affair in Tasmania. You'd get busted left, right and centre. You can't misbehave here because everyone pretty much knows you. So it is good. But I quite like that community, sort of everyone <laughs> knows everyone's business kind of thing. So you can sort of chat to the Premier because you'll see him. And in my field, I see him at functions and things all the time. And yeah, so it's good that you, you can do that because it, it is you know we all like so it's, it's sometimes it's who you know rather than what you know and if you can get a foot in the door it'll help you you know i'm not going to deny that and, and many, i'm not going to say they're going to use it It'd be crazy not to many years ago x you had to make a big decision to decide you were going to live in hobart for your career you went you mm. travel out, went across the world melbourne sydney all over australia and and the world and come back and thought no nah, i'm going to live in hobart make a career in hobart that was a that was a big decision yeah yeah it was but i realized after the first couple of sort of shows i did that I, and the good thing was in the first one i did lion king and we went to shanghai and came back so um yeah, I realised that I could do it from here. It's fine because I didn't want to uproot my whole life. It's okay if you're 19, 20, 21, 22. You don't have your own house. You, you can, you know, but I, I broke into professional musical theatre on the mainland and the world stage at the age of 35. So by 35, you're usually pretty established. It was a risk that I took and it, it sort of paid off. Yeah, there's some been some auditions and stuff I couldn't make sometimes my agent will ring on a Monday and say can you turn up to this studio to audition for this film tomorrow at 10 o'clock you know and it's four o'clock on a Monday afternoon and you think gee how do I get to Melbourne at 10 o'clock I better check the price of flights the next morning and sometimes you know all you can do is get a, a business class flight for $878 and you think you gotta weigh up whether that's going to be worth it whether you think you're going to be able to uh, get a chance of, of doing a role so yeah look I was quite out of it I'd made this rule that I wasn't going to make a break for the mainland or anywhere else if I didn't get anywhere till I was 35 and literally two months before my 35th birthday I got into the Lion King so you know I had to like stick I'm true to my word this is what happens I say things and then I feel guilty about not sticking to them so I stuck to that and most recently it's bit me on the bum because if we can just go over to cricket for a second a massive Hurricanes uh, fan well I was and the family have been members ever since they started we all have reserved seats and we love going to the Big Bash because it's got that family thing it's not for the heart you know the heart the hardcore cricketers, we love our tests and we love our one days, but it's good to be able to have the family and it's very popular and I, I think there's a place for it. But um, they broke my heart last year, Stoney, when they, they keep choking in the finals, which is fine. Everyone does that. Hello to the Geelong supporters. Um, but I thought, you know, they were doing really well last year. They had two matches left. They, one of them was the Sixers, the top team who ended up winning it last year. And they thrashed them. We beat the top team. I thought, this is good. And the week after, final game, must win to get us into the finals against the Renegades. And we lost. Not only did we lose, we're all quite chummy and smiley at the end of it. Isn't it? So I basically went on a rant on social media and said, that's it. Oh, my heart has been broken too much. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to have to... I'm leaving the Hurricanes and I basically, I've started going for the Melbourne Stars. I've got a jersey and a hat. Really? People be don't believe me. Yeah, I've done, I'm, I'm still member mem member at the Hurricanes. I'll still go. When they're not playing the Stars, I'll wear the purple with my family. But on Christmas Eve, when we're playing the Melbourne Stars here at Blunston Arena, my family will be in their purple Hurricane stuff and I'll be there and be bright green Melbourne Stars jersey and be black with the Stars logo, Melbourne Stars hat. And I'll be, a lot of people know me here. I'll be like, I'll cop some abuse. I mean, I know the ground announcer. You know, he's picked me out before on the big screen, so he'll probably go again and say, what the hell is John X doing? But because I said it on social media, I've got to stick to it. Because one thing I liked about the Stars, even though, I mean, what pressure? You called the Stars and last year they were hopeless. They look disappointed when they lose. They were really upset. And that's what I want to see the hurt on their faces. I want to see if they say we've let our fans down, I want to see them look like they feel they've let their fans down. And that's why I wasn't getting that love from the Hurricanes. And it was just too much. And this year was also the year I gave the Bombers the last chance. But, geez, they redeemed themselves very nicely this year. They're going to be Hang all right, on. X, the Bombers. They're going to be okay. Well, we'll see. Now, X, got a family. You've got two kids. How old are your kids? And are they into uh, acting or are they actors or actresses in the making? Calliope, Buffhead, she's seven, nearly eight. She's a dancer and has been dancing since she's two. That's she sort of followed in mum's footsteps. She's very good at that. She tried a bit of Oz kick and she goes for North Melbourne. She's been a member of the Bombers since she was two as well, but she's, that's just the membership. I took her to see the North Melbourne games here at Blunston because as you do, again, I, I love my sport. So we're all, the whole family are members of North Melbourne, even though I'm a Bombers fan because I want to support any AFL we get here. And we go to all the games and she fell in love with the stupid kangaroo mascot and she goes for North Melbourne. Devastated when Ben Brown left. Devastated when he left. And <laughs> I, she's got a chart on the wall of all the headshots from that year and there's a big sort of cross. Cross, cross over Benny Browns. But hasn't he done well? Go to Melbourne, win a premiership. That's right. Good on him. So, yeah, so she goes for North Melbourne and she tried a bit of Oz kick and she loves it. She's got the kit 
and everything, but I think dancing is going to be the way with her. Her brother, Num Nuts, he's only three, but his motor skills are a lot better than hers were. In fact, he throws better now than she does now. He throws better at three than she can do at seven. Got a good throw on him. Um, he's pretty rough and tumbled. Like the amount of times his head butted the ground is extraordinary. How he doesn't have brain injuries uh, beyond me. But I think he'll bend. He likes old balls. We've got 6,000 balls throughout the house, all sort of different sizes and shapes and things. So, um, well, But he also dances. My wife's got him in there. And I don't mind that because that helps with his coordination. Motor, motor skills, yeah. Some footballers who started young as dancers, and they're the ones that can leap and high flow dances, gymnastics, any of that sort of stuff, I think keeps you in good stead for, for sports. So I'll, we'll see how we go. We'll, as soon as he starts kinder next year, we're going to try and get him into um, some sports, hopefully. Excellent. I just want to take you through a few things. You do radio, MC work, TV work, you do some corporate work, you do a lot of charity. Your last charity, hey. Ride Freddy? Ride Freddy, was it? Yeah, yeah still going. Um, the actual ride happens in November. Where we we'll ride right around Tasmania in bright yellow Vespers with black stripes because Vespa is Italian for wasp. For a young little boy called Eddie McDonald who's got Ponto Cerebella Hypoplasia Type 4, which is he's the only one in the world with Type 4. He'll never walk. He gets fed by a tube. Um, his mum just needs a, a special chair to get him around and a thing to lift him into a special car. So we need to raise about 85 grand. I think we're raised about 60 at the moment. So only 25 grand off. We'll probably do that on the ride around Tassie. But that's um, between you and me. It's also eight days away from the family, and I'll probably get some sleep on that right riding around the state but you know when i say around the state the furthest point is like four or five hours away so you can always you know race home if you need to but yeah that's that's a, i do a lot of charity work and that's um it's been really good for you know it's the only way i can give back you know i'm not super rich i'd love to donate a million bucks to you know the heart foundation or whatever but i don't have that sort of money so the one way of me giving back is i do a lot of mc work and a lot of public speaking work and, and i arrange entertainment through some of the actors i know to perform big musical numbers and stuff at, ch- at charity dinners it's the only way i've, I've got of, of giving back and i'm more happy to do it because at the end of the day it doesn't cost me anything to stand up and MC a, a dinner and be a bit of a smart ass and be a bit cheeky a bit like I'm doing with you now that's that's so I do do that and I, I love giving back and I just love helping people my wife sort of has a go at me sometimes because I never say no to things I'm always I'm the yes man so I'll just say yes and, and try and make it work there's one night when I'm finishing Rocky Horror at 10 o'clock and literally at quarter past 10 I'm running two blocks down the road to Salamanca near Princess Wharf number one or, or I'm, going to the, I'm going to the Grand Chancellor only a block away to um do the live auction probably in costume probably still with my microphone on for speak up stay chatty which is a sort of mental health uh charity down here suicide prevention sort of uh, charity so i'm going to do that you know people think i'm mad having done a two-hour show i'm just going to race down the road but that's what i do wind of the willows wizard of oz crooner billy elliott hello hello what yeah. has been rocky horror what has been your i know this is a hard hard question what's the mm. most favorite role you've played in any of the things you've done in your whole career i would have to say because it was my first big professional musical and it was such a massive massive show it would have to be playing pumba the flatulent warthog in the lion king have to it's a two and a half meter long puppet that you have to operate as well and you stick out the top the big mohawk so it was good for someone with no hair. It was good to have lots of hair. Yeah, look, that, that was the one. I, I got to do City of Melbourne. And Pumbaa's like one of those great characters that everyone loves. It's like Santa Claus. You can't do a thing wrong. And got to travel for the first time overseas with a show in, and do it in Shanghai for three and a half months. My wife came with me. So all that really that really helped. Um, so I think I think that that one there, because it was a, such, a great, such a great character. Universally renowned. People love him. So it was, that was good for me. And it was something that came naturally too. I could naturally do the voice. And I was Pumbaa. So a role that you sort of you felt at home. I mean, so I'd have to say that one, but they're all, they're all, you know, they're all really special. And I really like making people laugh. And that's the other reason why Pumba is also special because he's quite funny. Last couple of ones for me, X. Why have you stopped Tasmanian World News? I love that show. X. Why isn't that still going? <laughs> now that came out of the pandemic. There's a guy here called David Gurney who runs Blue Rocket Productions, who's a an- national, internationally renowned animation company. And of course, when COVID hit, they, they were, they were decimated as well. So, and I think they're still struggling now. Like they're having a lot of trouble because the government sort of cut a lot of the Aussie content out of things um, and all the networks and stuff are buying stuff from overseas so they don't have to put any Australian content anymore and that's what they were doing they were making Australian animation sort of stuff so um, he came up with this idea because you know he loves stirring the pot he'd always have pictures of the Hobart airport because we've got the Hobart airport it's called the Hobart International Airport <laughs> it's always been called that but we don't have any international flights <laughs> so it's, it's always quite funny so yeah he came up with this idea to have this mock sort of present new, bad presenter news team that are on Zoom and it it just went insanely popular and we got some early COVID funding money to produce a whole bunch of episodes that he would write and we'd sort of we'd do this I'd be in my house like this with a little fake background thing and then all the other people and we'd all sort of zoom we'd film it on our own we'd get these cameras and we'd film on our cameras but we'd all be talking to each other on the zoom anyway so we'd do 
the news and he would edit it all together. There's a lot of work. When the money ran out, you just can't spend half all your week editing uh, an episode. But we went to different towns and stuff and people felt ownership. We did a lot of film clips about New Norfolk and booze and all these different towns and people sort of like you mentioning their town. It's that whole thing that people like stuff they can relate to um, and they feel ownership of. And it was very popular. And people still, I'm glad you said that because someone the other day said to me, where's the Tasmanian World News? So we're trying to get it back. But the funny thing was a lot of people think it's serious. So we deliberately sort of mispronounce things and I'd make a lot of yeah. malapropy <laughs> stuff. And but people think we're serious. So they're on social media trying to correct, correct us the whole time. Yeah, and I play Gary Heckenberg and I get to wear a wig, which is also um, exciting. And he's the news presenter who takes it seriously. And there's a, a bogan called, I can't remember what his name is, from Bruni Island. So I'll ask you questions there. Why is Tasmania such a great place? And what was the best piece of advice you were given when you ran into your career? Question without notice, uh, by the way. The best advice I got from anyone, especially in my job, especially, but I think in anything, you never stop learning. Never think you know everything. No matter how good you might be or how accomplished you might be in your career, there's always something you could learn from anyone, from the oldest, most experienced person to a young person just coming in. So just always be alert, be aware for that, and be, and be prepared to be a sponge and, and, and take things on. And also the other thing was just to be respectful of everyone. That's the biggest thing we sort of forget, especially if we become popular and, um, you know, we think we're sort of above everyone else. And we'll you, you forget to respect people, and that's all that matters. You just got to get along. That's it. So um, that was the best advice I got. And that's what the advice I like like to give people. You know, you never stop learning. So never, never think you know everything because it'll it'll be to your detriment if you do. And just respect everybody. And as far as Tasmania goes, gee, we take like we take it for granted. And I remember it's funny, it's changed in my career. When I first went over there, they all make the two-headed jokes and where's your scar and all that sort of stuff. And that doesn't happen now. But the thing with Tasmania is because we're so small, because we've always been the underdog, I mean we're just we're just friendly. We're just like those little sort of puppies that sit in the back of the the pound and you're sort of looking for a dog and you notice this quiet little puppy sitting in the background who's just nice and quiet respectful and um and and so and that's what we are people say to me oh geez those people are so friendly in Tasmania it's like yeah we're just sort of one big family I don't know what it is because I, I come from here but again it's that thing of like you don't know what you've got until you miss it you stay go and live in a hotel room in Melbourne for two years doing a show then you realize what you miss and you come back and go oh, okay this is this is what I miss this is where I, I want to be so it's just uh it's just our culture down here that's what we're like we've always been the underdogs we're not we're only like 30 40 years behind the rest of the country but you know we don't have the big skyscrapers and we don't have the massive populations and i remember used to go to, to melbourne on a tuesday night and be up swanson street and seeing all these people everywhere and it felt like i was at the constitution dock on new year's eve watching the fireworks in hobart and it was just a tu- average tuesday night in melbourne you know it's just that whole we're just a, we're just one big sort of happy family here and we don't you know there are problems with tassie don't get me wrong they, they don't like change there's a lot of an older population that don't like change and change is inevitable you've got to change to make things better for the people who are growing up and, and again we don't know everything we don't get everything right but at the moment we're, we're, we're flying high whether it's because you know we've been really anal about the COVID and, but because we're an aging population we're just a bit old school I guess and I think people miss that in the hustle and bustle when you come you know drop someone in Sydney or drop someone in Hobart they're going to experience two massively different worlds and I think I, I love Melbourne because Melbourne just you know you're all just doing Melbourne you're just happening whereas in, in Sydney they're just so full on I realised when I was over there but nothing beats Tassie we're just we're, we're, we're very laid back and we're very happy about where we are and and we just take the beauty for granted it is a pretty beautiful place because we don't have a massive population so we're relaxed at the moment John X good luck with Rocky Horror it's been an absolute pleasure having a chat You've been the guest on A1 TV, the Mars show this weekend. I look forward to catching up, X. I'm really keen to get down to Hobart. You know that I've got many friends down there and uh, it is my second home and I love it down there. And so good luck. And I'll be following uh, the fortunes of John X on social media. And uh, it's a very humorous thing. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, being part of the show. And I wish you all the best and uh, stay safe. And yeah, I'll get over there as soon as they let us. And go the Bombers. Go the Bombers.